Welcome. Today we begin with the first of three programs on preventing burnout. Today's program is about burnout prevention strategies for surveyors. For our next presentation, we'll be looking at burnout prevention strategies for caregivers, and finally, burnout prevention strategies for providers. As always, we'll be demonstrating our points with a few short scenarios that illustrate healthy and not so healthy ways to pre respond or prevent burnout. A word about burnout. The term burnout was coined by Dr. Herbert J. Freudenberger, a New York psychotherapist. Dr. Freudenberger wrote a book, Burnout, How to Beat the High Cost of Achievement, which was published in 1980. Dr. Freudenberger used the metaphor of a building that has been burned out, quote, a once throbbing structure where once there had been activity, now only crumbling reminders of energy and life. Dr. Freudenberger identified these symptoms from observing his clients. First, loss of meaning in their lives. Second, inability to get along with family, friends, and coworkers. Three, disillusionment with marriage or career and being tired and filled with frustration while at the same time needing increased amounts of energy to maintain the pace set. This cluster of symptoms is based both on the work environment, the work itself, and the individual. That's very important to keep in mind, especially when we face situations that are beyond our control and which require us to cope if we are to thrive. We'll be looking at an example of what I'm talking about in a few minutes. Now, although burnout is not included in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, or DSM-4, published by the American Psychiatric Association, and so is not considered a valid diagnosis, the symptoms of burnout are similar in many ways to depression, anxiety, and a disorder called somatization disorder. And I'll be talking about more about that uh, toward the end of the program. Without any further delay, let's take a look at Arthur Benevolent and his healthy and not so healthy responses to the same stimulus, organizational stressors that pose an influence on either provoking a burnout response or a coping response. Arthur Benevolent has worked for the company for 18 years. He is highly competent, conscientious, and is highly regarded by his co-workers who frequently seek his advice about coping with the many changes the new owners of the company, the Carl family, have introduced since acquiring the company one year ago. Uh, the old hunt and peck. Sit down, sit down. What's up? As soon as he graduated from private university, Charles Carl, the 23-year-old heir to the Carl fortune, was appointed by his father, James, who is the CEO, to be the supervisor of the section where Arthur works. James wants Charles to learn the business from the ground up, and especially to learn from Arthur, whom James sees as a highly valued resource to help with the changeover to the new corporate culture under Carl ownership. However, all James tells Charles is that while Charles is Arthur's boss, Charles should see Arthur as a mentor and advisor, much as he is to the other staff. Charles, even though you're going to be the boss, I want you to look at Arthur as a mentor, as an advisor. No problem. You got it. Unfortunately, James mistakenly believes that just by making a pronouncement that Charles should look to Arthur as a mentor and advisor, James needs to do no more. James does not monitor his son's entrance into the work life as a supervisor with dire consequences. That my combined drunken fraternity does better work than you do. You Red tie, you, yes. You Charles seeks to make up for his shortcomings and knowledge of the business with arrogance and micromanagement. He insults staff, corrects non-existent errors, and imposes impossible deadlines for no other reason than he believes he can. Because if it was me, you'd be out. You would be completely gone and done for. Arthur, did you just see how Charles was treating Anne? Charles sees Arthur not as a mentor, but as a competitor, who also serves as a refuge where stressed workers can go to get his advice. 
Charles knows that his father sees Arthur as a great resource to the company, and so he starts to attempt to undermine Arthur's informal status. Any assignments Arthur completes, always on time, are greatly criticized and poorly edited. Charles edits to improve Arthur's writing, often yield writing that is grammatically incorrect. Charles insists that any edits he makes to Arthur's writings are in final. We was going to adapt the format. Well, Charles is my boss. Really more like a son. I guess the best thing I can do is, is just outlast him. He's got to wise up. I yeah, like this, this Mercedes right here, the unbelievable S600. Oh, did I tell you guys that my grandmother died? I mean, it, it's terrible, but... For his part, Charles cultivates sycophants, individuals whose devotion to Charles are second only to their own ambition. Within six months of taking over as supervisor to Arthur's section, most of Arthur's co-workers have resigned, replaced by an ever-growing cadre of fawning flatterers. Thank